We rejoin uh, a conversation with Robert Greenfield, the author of The Last Sultan, which is a biography for 2011 of the uh, Ahmed Ertekin, the founder of Atlantic Records, uh, also known as the greatest record man of all time. Uh, I met Bob when I was really just a, a toddler, maybe six years old, in the south of France. And we were uh, page boys at, at a wedding between Jagger, Mick Jagger and Bianca. So I handed him a rose and you know, kissed the bride and so forth. So this is part two, hope you enjoy it. One other note, was it, was it him that I heard who did say, well I think what we have to do is make records so good right that you know that that farmer down in, in the delta or wherever exactly will the guy who's getting in his truck and driving uh, he, he said he otherwise wanted to make we don't make it he said something sorry what, go he, he wanted to make records that were so good that some working man in the delta and he meant a black working man would get in his truck and drive to the nearest town to buy the record and okay. if it wasn't that good he wouldn't release it <laughs> well, uh, that's, you know, they the released idea. a lot of records that weren't that good, but, the, you know, the, the, the point to be made here is that in, in the historical context of that time, <clears throat> there was no television. Um, it was not that easy to hear black music on the radio, although there were some places where it was being played. And what's extraordinary to me now is that people who did, well, also there was a boom after the World War II, uh, black servicemen who had served in the war returned home. Uh, they had seen the world, quote unquote. There was money, the economy was booming. So that even people who were, quote unquote, not well to do had record players and a record cost less than a dollar. So almost anybody could afford to buy a record and once they bought the record, you know, that was the source of entertainment in their own homes. They could listen to it over and over. Right. Can I ask you a, a quick thing about, did you, sure. did you um, <clears throat> um, a, a couple of things, does, does anyone, I know his mum bought him a, a recording machine as well as you said, he used to go to the booth. Or something right. Like that. Did you, have you heard any of that? I have heard Ahmed singing Mess Around, which is pretty funny. <laughs> uh, even, you know, it's not Ray Charles. <laughs> but the, the great thing about people who have music in their heads Right. Is that even if they can't, you know, you can hear the melody. He's singing the melody. He just doesn't have a really good voice, you know. <laughs> uh, I, I've also, hello? Go on. Yeah, I've seen royalty statements. I mean, he, Ahmed wrote, and I don't have a precise number, but he wrote, you know, 10, 12, 15, 20 songs. Really? You know? None of them were great, but they were all recordable and good. See, the point being that because Atlantic was such a small company, the music publishers weren't giving them songs. You had to get a song from a publisher back then. And so out of desperation, Ahmed started writing his own songs so they could be recorded by his own artists. Well, okay, there's a couple of very interesting points there. Um, one, one is that did he ever, I mean, there's a couple of things. His parents, did they approve, presumably high society in America was, um, I don't know, high society, but mainstream society thought of a lot of this music as devil's music and all that sort of thing. Exactly. Stuff. Did that, did, and also did he, did that, cause him problems at all with the folks or politically and also did he not cross any uh, that's one question I'll just ask you that now yeah well but see again you know it's funny how uh, when you look at someone's life you know whether it's circumstance whether you know we make our choices or our choices make us <clears throat> after Ahmed's father died uh, Ahmed's mother who was musical very musical played instruments sang loved music and his younger sister returned to Turkey. Yeah. <laughs> so he and Nesui were left in America, free. and therefore he was free to do as he liked. There was no judgment and no control from, from his family. Okay. Um, but, but presumably then he was just really with the in, in, intelligentsia experiencing that, 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 that you know, artistic, um, whatever, and intellectual pursuits. Um, can I ask you one other question? Yes. Um, Actually, no, let's just go back to the other thing. Okay, so he didn't necessarily cross, uh, uh, come into conflict with uh, the authority in America because he was doing this black music, as we could, as far as we can tell. Well, Charlie, it's a really good question. Nobody cared about black music. It, it was below the radar. I mean, it was music made by black people for black people, performed in black theaters, attended only by black people. So it 
well, no one now can understand the level of separation between white and black culture at that period in America. Uh, there was an entirely separate black world. There was a black middle class, black merchants, black stores. Okay. There wasn't much of a crossover. Okay. So, he, again, he was free to do as he pleased. Which kind of brings me to, so right, so, so he was free to do as he pleased. So he's kind of like the preachers doing his own thing. Which is, there's an interesting analogy, I think Kid Rock had this great comment at, at the <laughs> Atlantic Showcase where he said that yeah. bunch, there was a bunch of assholes really more into whatever was going on, not the show. Uh -huh. And um, Ahmed sat sort of front and center, took the whole thing in, uh -huh. went home, didn't say anything, called him up the next morning and said, well, how's my young Elvis? Right. It, it, the, the point you know, being, the analogy being is that even back then, Ahmed was looking for his own, uh, what he thought was good. Not really. Well, the, the, you know, the point is well taken, but in order to survive for as long as Ahmed did, to start a company in 1948 and still be more or less running the company when he died in 2006, Ahmed was also able to adapt to the changing tide of popular culture in America. Okay. And when you, when you bring up him telling Kid Rock, uh, you're my young Elvis, really the first person he saw as his young Elvis was, well, he tried to sign Elvis, but, really? but the, the, colonel, the colonel wanted more money and went with RCA. Uh, <laughs> so really, Atlantic's white Elvis was Bobby Darren. Oh. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, Ahmed's partner, Herb Abramson, A-B-R-A-M-S-O-N, had made a few sides with Bobby that didn't work, and Abramson was on the outs at the company. And Ahmed at Atlantic? Saw, sorry? At Atlantic? Yes, yes, yes. And, and Ahmed saw the talent and took Bobby Darren in the studio and produced Splish Splash, which was the great big hit. And Darren had one hit after another, including Mac the Knife, which Ahmed brought him. I mean, only Ahmed would have been having lunch with Lottie Lenya, Kurt Lyle's widow, who said to him, why don't you ever return, record any of my husband's music? And Louis Armstrong, who Ahmed adored, had recorded Mac the Knife. Right. And Ahmed brought it to Bobby Darren, and it was a huge hit for Bobby Darren. Okay. So that kind of takes, again, this, this idea of him. I think, I think he split up with Abrams, Abramson because, uh, I think, did Abramson, or was it work that they wanted to just pursue more pure jazz and blues? No, it, it, it was more personal. Abramson had left the company for a couple of years because he had to do his army service. And when he came back, Jerry Wexler had superseded him as Ahmed's partner. And Jerry Wexler, who I spoke to extensively before his death, was a very brilliant, driven guy okay. uh, who had an amazing ear for music and was a great producer mm -hmm. who then you know, made all the great Aretha Franklin albums. And really, there was no more room in the company for Herb, so okay. uh, he, 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 he was more or less helped out the door uh, okay, by the two of them. It was Nessui, uh, Ahmet, and Jerry Wexler at that point, okay. and they continued to run the company for many years. Okay, let's just go back to your other point. Only Ahmet would be sitting with Lottie, right. who was it? Who was it Lottie Lenya, L-O-T-T-E-L-E-N-Y-A. Who was the wife of? Good, if the wife of Kurt Vile, who composed Three Penny Opera, based on a play by, on work by Bertolt Brecht. Okay. So, I mean... Okay, great. <clears throat> okay, one other thing. Uh, yeah. Did, the, uh, did he ever, I mean, I suppose, this kind of, you kind of answered this, and that people were not taking black music that seriously, but did he, you know, he, he did, I think he took Ray Charles from, from chess, was it? No. No, Ray Charles was on Swing Time. Swing Time, sorry. Okay. And his contract was expiring, and okay. Ahmed knew his agent, and Ahmed bought him for $2,500. Okay. So a couple of questions just about, you know, again, it, it seems like you said events often force, you know, people right. into greatness as opposed to people trying to force themselves into right. greatness. Right. Um, do you think that, uh, and I'm just poking around here because it yeah, seems, yeah. you know, the music business has been full of shysters or different people from different, um, uh -huh. you know, he, he doesn't uh -huh. seem to have been certainly not, uh, from what we can tell, that sort of guy. But for him to kind of break ground and, and sort of take on RCA or, or uh, Chess, I can't remember the other ones who were there, um, did he ever, you know, did he, did, was there ever any, any sort of like, well, who are you to start coming into this market? 
No, because, he, you know, when you say he never took on RCA, the majors were a different world. The majors were putting out major artists like Peggy Lee and, you know, Georgia Gibbs and all the popular white music of that era. The people who were in the independent record business, like the Chess Brothers, they were, they were you know, it's bizarre. Although they were th technically competing with one another, they all knew one another, and they were kind of friendly with one another. They, again, they were white men in a black business, and they all dealt with the same distributors, and, you know, they all dealt with the same issues and problems, and even, they weren't really competing personally against one another. Okay. They were, it, it was more collegial. Okay, quick question just about uh, uh, dollars and cents. Uh, you said he, uh, Ray Charles, he, he bought, he gave him a, the contract. He, the contract yeah. ran out, so he could have given him contract for what, 15, what was it? 2500 2500 Um Just out of curiosity, the dentist who gave them that 10 grand and the right. 2500 do you have any idea? I know it sounds like a small amount of money now, but really was it a small amount of money then? What, what no, it was a huge amount of money. And as I've just learned, the dentist was an inveterate gambler. And therefore, was you know he had two houses or something, and he mortgaged one of his houses. That's an enormous sum of money in 1948, $10,000. I, I can't analogize it now. It might be as much as a quarter or a half a million dollars. I was going to say, it's, it's a quite a chunk of change. And $10,000 was more than most people made in a year in America back then, much more. Okay, so he took it, but he, his, his investment, I think he came out with $3.5 million when they sold Atlantic. Yeah, but I'm just curious. I mean, going back to it, here's a guy who uh, apparently just really loves black music. And I think, did they start a record shop initially? No. No, no, okay. But he, who really loves um, black music, and he's he's going into it. He persuades with his brother, right. this, right. this dentist friend, to invest half a million dollars, quarter of a million dollars. Right. Um, that that is not just someone who's you know a student who loves music. That's someone who's like he's got a plan. Um, you make a very good point. He Ahmed was incredibly charismatic, although he was kind of strange as a young man, became something else as he got rich and famous. Mm -hmm. But he, he, listen, you can't be in that business and not be able to sell. Even though Ahmed was always cool, unlike the other independent record companies who, owners who were screamers and, you know, more stereotypical, <laughs> you know, shop owners. Okay. Uh, Ahmed had the ability to persuade people that he knew what he was doing and that, listen, the guy didn't give him 10000 because he liked him. He gave him the 10000 because he thought he was going to make more money from from it. And we don't know what particular things he presented, like examples or anything like that. Probably not. Uh, of well, why. I mean, he must presume he said, well, well, these guys are selling some records. Blah, blah, blah. Well, what it was basically was the fact that he was in partnership with Herb Abramson, who had already worked at the National Records and, Jub and had a, two labels of his own, Quality and Jubilee. I think the family dentist, the doctor, uh, you know, was persuaded that uh, for this investment, uh, he could recoup his money and more because um, black records sold to black people. Okay. I mean, there was a market. That's the point. And, and we don't know what um, <clears throat> we don't know what uh, I mean. What do they do with two, two a quarter of a million dollars in those days? I mean, do they buy studios and offices? And everything? No, no. It's a, no. This is a good question. Ahmed uh, uh, lived in the Hotel Jefferson in New York, which was condemned actually. <laughs> And uh, that was the office, and that's where he lived. I mean, they had no money. The money, the $10,000, went to pay session musicians, uh, engineers. Uh, <laughs> it, went in, it went into the business. I mean... So it was still a purist enterprise, even though there's a lot of money around. Well, it, it is and it isn't. The point being that at the same time he's doing this, Ahmed is still out every night, all night. Uh, he's buying the finest clothes. He owes money all over town. He has really? bills everywhere. No, no, well, you know, the royals don't pay their bills. Right, they, right. You know, and, and he's constantly, you know, uh, importuning his family back in Turkey for money. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is what makes Ahmed different. He, he's not like a, uh, a penny-pinching, hard-working, I mean, he's hard-working, <laughs> but he, he's living like a lord with no money while he's making, you know, iconic rhythm and blues records. He's taking the paradigm of a lord and transposed it onto a sort of rock and roll. Uh, I, 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 I think that is exactly right, and I think if you trace his career, that's how he signs the Rolling Stones. Uh, because yeah. if, if you look 
at both Keith and Nick and the people that they went into business with, right. Prince Rupert von Lowenstein, you know, Keith and Mick always gravitated towards people who were, you know, either born to nobility or had a certain sensibility, which is why they liked your father, Tommy, right? Right, right, right. Now, who, who came from a class that they were not born in, but represented something that they think that they understood. So you stretched out in room 1009 with a smile on your face and a tear in your eye. Oh, come see the girl Quite an accomplished author in, in rock music, and also he was the uh, associate editor of Rolling Stone magazine in London. It's some funny stuff, all that's actually recounted. What he's alluding to is, is in that book. He wrote a book about the family, one family's tempestuous you know, journey through the 60s and the Cultural Revolution. It's called The Day in the Life, and you can also get that on Amazon.com. And, and, uh, but uh, more interestingly, uh, Ahmet's uh, life story is fascinating, life changing in terms of. Uh, the culture of bringing black music to the world, uh, and he really is, you know, possibly the greatest record of all time. Fascinating star. Um, there's a big, old, not just a big connection with the Stones, obviously with Zeppelin, a lot of very big acts, um, and also on it was producing up until a really classy goes with his life with Aretha Franklin and so forth but there is a, a big part to play the Stones uh, uh, and the Channel 8 uh, film was where he passed away uh, and indeed you know where Robert uh, Greenfield and, and my family met uh, was uh, at the Stones at Melcott when they were calling it on Main Street 